Have you recruited? Have you recruited anybody yet? No. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. I think what I'll do is um, I'll ping some people on my end itself uh, because I think I, I really want us to push on that thread as an idea and it might just be useful to have just one or two more people. That would go a long way. Yes. Yeah. Sure. No, no, no. I think I did start to look into MEEP simulation. Um, yeah. I'm just starting with it and I'm experimenting with how chat GPT can help me understand how it works, which is also yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah. But um, yeah. And yeah. it also provided me with values for how the parameters for different wall types need to be, which I can't trust because I don't get the source, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it's a start. Yeah. Yeah. And you remember, right? I also sent you a third paper. You have that, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. Let me check on Discord for a second. Every team has their channels now, right? Uh, I don't see the cup of coffee. Um, can I see do you or anybody? I'll just make that as a Yeah, uh, not yeah, Manu. <laughs> oh Tafia, yeah. What was the name again? Do you guys want a cup of coffee is good? Yeah, for now okay. it's good. <laughs> yeah, you know it's not you guys can change it anytime. We need a we need a place for discussions to happen. Uh, That's one of us. Yeah, yeah. And we we made a Discord. Uh, sorry, the Notion page oh, as well. Um, yeah, I think you guys can do that. The idea is what is on Discord is a little bit of a transparent communication, so lots of people can then come in and join and give advice and feedback while your otherwise kind of the more internal team, uh, you know, I would just want to move all the conversations we're having on WhatsApp to Discord, while the notion is much more for documentation. Uh, Abina, you can just give me a sense when uh, uh, people have trickled in in the class, because I don't know that. So yeah, uh, one more logistics before we start. Uh, Marwan, we are trying to ship things to Sudan, and we are having a hard time finding a uh, uh, companies that ship. Uh, so do you know a solution for that, for shipments from the U.S. to Sudan? Or anybody else in the group actually knows? Um, because DHL the carriers... Working. Say that again? DHL. DHL ships to Sudan? I think so. Okay, so I think what we have to do is figure out possibly to ship. Uh, yeah, I think there are complications. Well, I also around. check. I will also check with. Yeah, could you please check and figure out? And it might just be easier if somebody is flying. If you know somebody who's flying home or the other way around from US, then we can ship to a US address. Okay. Yeah, just let's explore that. I think uh, I know Jasmine is stuck currently, and especially because, uh, I mean, you know, Nature's Diary is a primarily education-focused project, so it would make a lot of sense for us to ship a ton of things to you guys. Um, uh, okay, I think maybe yeah. we'll wait a minute or two more. Abina, do you think we have folks in the room? Yeah, I think we have a good number of people in the room now, so we can go ahead. Yeah, and you know, if if they're not there on time, it's uh, it's not my problem. It's uh, every, yeah, it's their problem. Uh, yeah, let's get started. I think. Uh, sorry again uh, to the folks uh, on campus. Uh, I'm doing this on Zoom today. I have some morning meetings in San Francisco, so it just ended up being too complicated. Uh, we're going to start with a quick Fred Park for the, the team that had not had the chance to present, and then I want to dive in into the content. So, Alankrit, you can share your screen, maybe five minutes right. discussion on the project. All right, I'll do that now. Um, I guess this is not what you're looking at. Um, are you seeing the correct screen? My Fred Park should be here. We the browser. Yeah, we see yeah, it. This is Perfect. Right okay, yes. good. Uh, so our team is called LabX. Uh, we are still looking for a better name. Uh, but my team includes, our team includes Devyanshi, Ishan, uh, and myself. And we are being mentored and we're getting a lot of good feedback from Subir as well on our project. Um, so we'll all uh, share what we have to talk about. But 
the key question that we started was from how do you undertake scientific experiments while not compromising on the grades and the marks aspect? So just to give everyone context, because it's not the same uh, procedure to perform experiments across the world. So at least in India, how we do experiments is we have weekly lab experiments, lab practicals, where we go into an experiment. And if the equipment is is you know is free or nobody is using it, so you get a chance to do it. Otherwise, you know you go home and then you have to wait again for your turn. Um, and then over time, over usage, these experiments uh, get degraded in quality. They break, convex lenses break, and mirrors break. So there is degradation in quality as well. And there's one more point that when there are practical exams, um, students do not have the means to these experiments at home. So they cannot really revise for their practicals. They cannot really uh, get a feel of the experiment that they had done, say, six months back. So they cannot really do it before their exams. Um, so we are tackling this problem about how to undertake experiments and make it fun and applying frugal concepts while not compromising on the grades aspect. Because it, in India, at least, grades is a big incentive that people have. And I mean, it's unfortunate, but I do not blame the students and the teachers that there is a lot of emphasis on, you know, getting grades out of it. So not taking a lot of time uh, diving into the Fermi problem here, uh, the total education budget for India is about 12 billion uh, USD. Uh, this total school enrollment is about 260 million kids. Um, so overall, on an average, it turns out to be $50 per child for one year. So the government spends about $50 on one child on everything that includes uh, teacher salaries, infrastructure, uh, books, ed everything. But so you might understand how little expenditure is made on the practical part of the uh, practical part of school, right? And this is on an average, there is a lot of gap between rural and urban, etc. So the, the things that we are going to focus on is how do you perform experiments at home that are relevant to your school curriculum? And how do you include the frugal aspect and the aspect of making experiments fun? Uh, so what we are proposing is we are proposing accessible lab kits of experiments which are focused on the school curriculum. Uh, these they would be a focus on assembling the kit, and these kits would we'll try to make them as durable as possible. And uh, we spoke with Sudhir, and we got a feedback that these experiments need to be fun as well, right? Otherwise, why would a child want to do an experiment? We started off with the grades being the only incentive, but I feel making the experiment fun. Is is a is a is an important factor too. Uh, so this is these are our functional requirements. This is our Fermi problem. Um, should I jump into the design parameters or are there questions? Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, let's do a quick version of the design parameters and then we'll do one or two questions. Okay. All right. So what we are targeting is the direction that we are taking right now is we are focusing on a specific uh, school, a specific grade, and we are tackling specific physics experiments from that grade. So, for example, in class 11th, you have uh, an experiment to find the acceleration due to gravity with a pendulum, right? So you have to. So I mean, our focus would be on to find essential components that are uh, that are that need to be part of this setup. And then we need to understand if they can find these components at home or they can, we can provide them. So this kit would either have directions to find them in their home or it would have something that they cannot find at their home, right? So let's say something, we need an ammeter or a voltmeter, right, for an experiment. You cannot, I mean, it's difficult for a child to create an ammeter from scratch. So we will provide this in the kit itself, but we will encourage them to find something like a wire which they need from their house itself or you know from their school or something like that so there is that element of doing it yourself making it fun mm -hmm. frugal as well as connecting it to your your school uh, curriculum uh, uh, right mm -hmm. so this is what uh, we are focusing on and uh, what another design parameter that we need to consider is what is the budget constraint uh, then we need to focus on is it 10 dollars is it 5 dollars uh, but it all depends from ex experiment to experiment. And we have not really put into a lot of thought in the cost. Uh, so I feel these are some parameters that we are working towards. Yeah, I think let's take quick questions. Uh, uh, first, a few comments. First of all, it's a, it's a fantastic thread, uh, you know, primarily because there is a lot of material and really fun experimental material out there. You type in YouTube and you can get a ton of stuff. But often enough, because it's not mapped one-to-one -one with the school curriculum, teachers don't have an incentive to do that. 
And sometimes what we've been often told is how do you find time uh, to be able to engage? And then those uh, the sessions that are dedicated to the labs would be one of the times. So, you know, I think the first decision that you guys have to make is the formal versus informal. Some of the activity is happening in a, a classroom in a school versus whether you want that something like this to be happening in people's home. Maybe people bring the materials from home, but mm -hmm. I would err towards thinking about structuring this much more in a formal setting where this does happen in school because, okay, I see. you know, I think uh, parents and people that are enthusiastic do lots of things at home, uh, but formal adaptation, when you are really thinking about working with the government to include, they really want a very directed uh, curriculum one-to-one -one match. And then I think the 11th class physics in India, that's a very narrow, very clean. What I would propose is choose a, a Hindi medium board uh, as mm -hmm. one example to just give you a place where, you know, private schools have a much better curriculum. Choose that curriculum and try to build a set of, say, choose a number that you care about, four or five. Uh, the reason you want to do it for multiple is that one will give you the sets of constraints, but you want to figure out how you can do many things with the same common parts. So there is a lot of commonalities. So choose something where there is a number, hmm. where there is multiplicity in what you're thinking about. And then finally, I think the other thing that you said I absolutely love is the some parts are brought from home because, you know, resistance can be, it's not just wires, even a feather has a resistance. Every, everything in our life has a resistance. So there's something quite interesting. Now, that's very poetic that life, life is a <laughs> resistance in general, uh, but it's useful to have that be ingrained because it would be very valuable for them to kind of relate to it. Because, you know, copper, you measure the resistance, they can be like, who cares? But if they if they me measured resistance of their soccer ball, then you're like, wait a second, what does that actually mean? You know, what is leather? What was this made of? Why was it this way? Would a deflated ball versus a non-deflated mm -hmm. ball would have different right. resistance? So I think, uh, and and try, structuring it in a manner where it's a one-to-one -one match between some kind of a curriculum that you guys take. Uh, right. Right. And I think that's the exact problem, right? There are so many experiments that people do online in schools, right? A lot of focus on doing these, but that grades, grades aspect, when would a student try to see where is this coming into use, right? I yeah. know it's unfortunate, but that's that is one of the problems. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I think it's it's a fantastic constraint to put on your uh, the design parameters. Uh, right. Any comments online before we jump to the? I want to. I have a lot of agenda items, but okay. any comments, feedback from anyone else? I wonder, Marwan, if you could talk to this team a little bit. I know because you've thought deeply about education, and I would love. You know, I think Alankrit and team, you guys should stay focused on the India context because I know you have lived experience there, but it would just be useful. Talk to Marwan and team. The idea is not isolated teams. It's just that Marwan and Parke are focused on Sudan. You guys should be focused on India, but have a conversation. Uh, so Sandy, I, go I, ahead. Yeah. I, I think... Uh, oh, Marwan, go ahead. Yeah, even uh, our problem it is overlap. Maybe, maybe uh, we build with a different strategy for the same uh, uh, problem with the same mindset. And I love uh, those teams because we can collaborate and think uh, together. I think, yeah. uh, I think uh, even if just doing experiment for science, it is a great idea and great value to see that uh, we we need to talk a lot together definitely marvan i'll shoot you a message and we can set up a time yeah and then just do that on discord so the communications are visible uh, all communications between teams try doing them on the team channels for the projects because i pop in and all the channels folks other folks will come in they just want to see and engage uh, and so instead of doing them in 
private channels, what ends up happening mm -hmm. is make it as visible as possible so others can engage. Okay. Uh, so I have a lot of agenda items, so I want to switch. So if you give the screen back to me, Alankrit. Okay. Uh, I want to, this is sort of one of the last formal lectures, but I want to finish this content before everybody's deep in projects. So just before I begin, uh, remember how many weeks are left before final presentations? Can somebody remind me? We have uh, two weeks. Two weeks left. So it's not that much time. Uh, this will be sort of the last formal lecture. And after that, everything will just be projects. Uh, and I know oh, uh, you had a question. Oh, Smriti, go ahead. I just had a comment. I did grade 11 and 12 here in India, all online, and we didn't get a chance to uh, enter a lab or even see any of the equipment. And I feel like this is a really good solution overall. Just even if I had it during the pandemic, I feel like I would have been more interested in chemistry. <laughs> because the bio experiment I was able to do like in a decentralized lab here, but I couldn't find my other equipment to do the physics labs. That was interesting for me. Yeah, so this is something I mean, that I would use. Yeah, the idea would be is to have this uh, while at the same time not pitch it as an alternative to, uh, you know, all virtual education, because I think working with people and all that stuff is still very important. Um, but, you know, I think, yeah, I can, I can see that point. Uh, yeah, and especially since if you have that experience, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so I think yeah, two weeks left, uh, not that much time. Uh, one of the threads that would be valuable is, um, you know, now the transition that has to happen for almost everybody in the teams is you have to do things with your hands. So kind of the, the time for just purely thinking is kind of done. Now it's you should play either that's done with simulations, either that's done with physical materials, either that's done with test setups. It is very valuable to actually physically play and not just think uh, in the idea space with you know, that will always happen, but there is something quite remarkable when you do things with your hands. So just for your projects, try to think about what is the minimal thing that I can do with my own hands where I am, whether it can be in materials, it can be in any aspect for your project. Uh, it's very, very valuable. And I think simulations count in that same way. Uh, And uh, so I'm going to switch for today's last. I want to cover compliant mechanisms, uh, both because they're important, uh, relevant to a lot of things we all do and think about. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do today is uh, just cover a little bit of a history on the side of the... Okay, can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're gonna try covering a little bit on the mechanics side uh, of uh, compliant mechanisms, some of the design processes involved. Uh, but one of the things uh, in the cost framework and perspective is the way you design objects is not the same that you traditionally design uh, because you're also trying to design for manufacturing. And this is a beautiful example of what I think a technique that has so much potential, uh, but is not actually still exploited as much as it should, because there are very little design tools. You know, there are no, unlike when you're trying to build traditional machines, there is a ton of design tools that you can refer to. There's a ton of principles that you can refer to. Uh, but this is a very creative space and primarily for that reason, because the design tools are not so accessible also to people, it's not used as much as it should. So just as a, a framework, uh, I'm just looking around myself to find a compliant mechanism. And I didn't have to look that far. I didn't, I can promise you, I didn't plan for this. I was just looking around, where is the closest compliant mechanism on my desk? And here is the simplest example. So 
you know, you can see all of you have played with uh, caps and boxes. Uh, so this is a compliant mechanism in the sense it's monolithic. It was made as a single stamp as a vacuum. And if you look right there at the hinge, uh, there is a little hinge right here, but there is no joint here. It's just a continuous material. And so the principle and a general idea is to use elasticity in given materials that's naturally present to incorporate a new function. And so the function this is incorporated is that the box closes, it seals, it does many types of things, but it's not done in the similar way that you would think about it. It's actually utilizing uh, almost some of the nonlinear properties uh, for the material itself. Man, um, can I add something? Absolutely, go ahead. Yeah. Our project actually is like a kind of a compliant mechanism. So I can show our example. It's all of Yeah, actually, yeah, I think. Yeah. Can people see what Adil is uh, building? And one of the things to think a little bit about there is also what we will talk quite a lot about this in the degrees of freedom. Uh, and actually, people can take a minute if they want, look around yourself, wherever you are sitting, and see what other compliant mechanisms you can find. So I see a water bottle sitting on that table, for example. See if you see a compliant mechanism in that. Look at the pen that you are writing with and try to see if you can find a compliant mechanism. A full scope has tons of compliant mechanisms. Uh, yeah, I think like right there, what do you have Deborah in your hand? It's like a USB stick with different versions, the enter magnet, right? So it's not the oh. compliant mechanism here isn't really used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other than transporting it maybe. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, Anybody has a ballpoint pen? Where can you find a, a compliant mechanism around? And again, you know, the, the point about these types of things is how do you design for simplicity? And that's not trivial sometimes. Uh, oh, a mouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the actual click. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the click there is, it's just the deformation of that shell that makes the click. And if you now open even the button that's used, that's on the PCB, that by itself has many compliant mechanisms. Uh, and I think it really is about, you know, just using a beam and a deformation is one thing, and we'll kind of go in order of complexity essentially. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna mention this uh, with a challenge. Uh, there is a challenge that somebody brought to us almost many years ago. And I've still been thinking about it. And again, I didn't mention this as a project this year, but I just want to share this challenge first, and then we'll dive into some of the principles associated with it. And the, the challenge really has to start with uh, what can we do with folks, uh, you know, from a context of prosthetics. So this is one example of an entity that we've been working with uh, and conversations we have had with uh, what is called Jaipur Foot. It's the world's largest prosthetic manufacturer. And what's really remarkable about this entity, it's based out of Jaipur. That's why it's called Jaipur Foot. Uh, they essentially provide prosthetics for free. People that come in, it doesn't matter what your financial background is. If you have the means, you can pay. But if you have nothing, you still go home with a prosthetic. Uh, they primarily currently focus on Firstly, they started with uh, essentially foots. That's why it's called Jaipur foot. Uh, eventually, the big challenge that came about is knees, and knees are much harder. And I'll give you the example of a project that started at Stanford a long time ago that then became Jaipur knee. Uh, and you know the numbers are just absolutely staggering in this kind of a space of just thinking about how much need for prosthetics essentially exists. Much of the need exists uh, that is unfulfilled need, uh, primarily because of accidents, war. Uh, there is a huge amount of need. Uh, and the, the thing that came about uh, from this uh, project and that interaction was what was called the Jaipur knee. And what's very interesting about this, as you can see, so on the left was that first version of the Jaipur knee. This is not a uh, example of a compliant mechanism, but it does have something quite special. 
which is a very clever trick in lubrication. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, you can start seeing, uh, there is this type of a knee design called polycentric. Uh, there is a conventional thread, which is a polycentric, but with a friction break. Uh, and then, of course, there are knees that have microcontrollers and motors that also have an active swing. So the question was, what is the simplest passive knee that could actually be made? And the, the polycentric designs have been around. The polycentric design is a four bar linkage that gives you kind of a feel for how the knee swings. Uh, but the real innovation in this was the use of a, a oil filled polymer that self lubricates while it degrades as a function of time. So one of the problem with many of these types of mechanisms is if you have wear and tear, you lose all the lubrication and you start getting, you know, you don't want your knee to be squeaking. Uh, and because uh, these sets of polymers themselves have uh, uh, oil filled resin in it, uh, you know, that, that, was, that was kind of one of the key innovations that essentially led to a massive design process. I'm going to just jump to the end. Uh, and then finally, you know, the sets of Joel was one of the students at Stanford. And then eventually this was commercialized uh, by uh, an entity out of DREV, uh, an entity in San Francisco. Uh, and, you know, this is what it became eventually, the Remotion Knee version 3. Uh, and some of this is now in deployment. Uh, you know, it's reduced the cost significantly. So, you know, it, it's not the same. It's still maybe around several hundred dollars. Uh, but... Uh, right there is kind of, you can start seeing sort of the distribution. Uh, and again, you know, both the types of materials involved change uh, dramatically. So it's mostly made out of polymers uh, rather than many metal pieces that are often seen because then you have to do things lightweight. Uh, there are lots of compliant mechanisms that you can also just think about in this. Uh, but the reason I'm just bringing this up is a problem that we've been thinking about for a while. So this is the very first test that was done in 2008. You can actually see the idea works, uh, which is very powerful. This is also what's so beautiful about Jepper Foot uh, is there are entities that really work with people. So for any projects like these, you know, you can think as much as you want, or you can just test with people and get feedback to say, hey, this is what works. This is what doesn't work. And it's been quite beautiful to actually see kind of these types of collaborations. Um, so the challenge that is on our table in some sense, and I think it's going to require a larger effort, but I've been thinking about taking this on, but I just want to share this with everybody, is can we do this with a, for a hand? And the hand is a much more complex problem uh, because, of course, so many parts, many sets of things. Uh, and again, you know, a hand is something that is critical many a times from a, a livelihood type of a perspective. Uh, you know, uh, this is 1939, uh, a kind of a compliant mechanism hand made with so many strings. I don't know if you guys can see the strings at the back. So, you know, in the space of design for hands, there is this artistic uh, almost, there is a lot that's existed, but nothing in a mass manufacturing way that's actually scalable. Uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of uh, a huge kind of a community of 3D printed hands per se. You know, I think these things are good as uh, teaching training projects, but uh, they haven't met the kind of a rigor that uh, entities like this especially require uh, in terms of functionality. And so there, here, uh, look and feel versus functionality is very different. And the functionality is what we are after. And from a context of functionality, frankly, you know, this is the ironic part of this problem the famous hook still remains and with one uh, opposable thumb still remains to be the most functional prosthetic hand. And we have had a very hard time just as a broader community to go beyond this as a design. And I think, you know, this is completely passive. You can literally see there is a rubber band there. There's one opposable thumb. Uh, there is a a spring between the two hooks that's usually used. Uh, and then uh, there is a little nub that mounts on someone's shoulder. 
and they use the degree of freedom of the shoulder to really be able to open that up. And so I think the conversation, and this was a design, the split hook design was 1912, and it still remains the gold standard. And the conversation that we've been having with Jaipur Foot, and something that at least uh, a hunch that I have in this space is that we need to rethink this from, I mean, again, this is too complex also to be made at scale. So even simplifying this further is actually important, but uh, from a functionality point of view and getting rid of, you know, what is the bare minimum electronic version of this, where we're not just dealing with uh, shoulder movements, but actually uh, a much more subtle movement essentially associated with an actuated version of something like this. Uh, but then do it in a compliant manner. And again, you know, there do exist many high-end hands in this space that do actually do far better. But of course, they are even orders of magnitude higher than the knees themselves. So anyway, this still remains an open challenge. I think there is a lot to be done in borrowing from the split hook from 1912 uh, but thinking about both a new class of manufacturing and thinking in terms of uh, what does the electronic version of something like that actually look like from a minimal scale. So anyway, this is, I just want to pose this as a compliant design challenge. Like what if you made the entire hand out of a single sheet that got folded together and had the entire compliant mechanisms in place? So this is the homework ass assignment and of course, it's an open-ended homework assignment. Uh, I've been doodling a design like this for a while, but I just want to share it. It just gives you the inspiration to say, there are 30, 40 parts in this. Could this really be done in a manner that is manufacturable, still has all the degrees of freedom? So with that as a kind of a prelude, let me just share a little bit about what is compliant mechanisms to begin with. And from a historic perspective, I think I would say credit Cavendish to be the very first experiment that truly utilized compliant mechanisms for something quite beautiful. So Cavendish is known, you know, speaking of physics experiments for measuring the gravitational constant. Uh, and one of the most beautiful experiments that was done that any of you can actually also do was done with, uh, you know, can we measure attraction between two masses on earth? And you can see, yes, moon and earth attract each other, but could you take a ball like a lead ball and measure the attraction? And so if you do the calculation, you will see that you need an ultra sensitive force sensor. So how do you make an ultra sensitive force sensor? And Cavendish had a brilliant idea, which is uh, called the torsional spring, which is if you take any wire, so I'm just gonna take, if I had any wire, and instead of measuring bending, what he's doing is measuring torsion. So if I hang something on it and then if I twist it, you can see it wants to twist back. So that's essentially a torsional spring. Uh, and he made an ultra thin wire. I think this wire was less than a hundred micron, uh, but it was very, very long. And there is a scaling law in torsional stiffness that makes it an incredibly linear spring. The problem is you want displacement, but you really want to be able to just make sure that it remains linear. And I don't know if this is a, uh, there's a fun video. Actually, let me see Cavendish gravity, if I can pull that out. Oh, I have the link right here. Uh, you can actually do this uh, in at, at home. Uh, this is kind of a fun sort of an exercise. Stop being together. Uh, and again, we're all being forced to watch an ad. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so all this is, is just a few weights, a ruler and a very long wire. So what he's talking about is that you had to leave this for 24 hours for it to be stable. You want no air flows in the room, but I think this is kind of the fun part. It's stable. He's going to leave some weights here very soon and something really remarkable actually happens. 
just two balls and look at the clock. The clock is ticking. There is, you know, some jiggling. And, you know, Dude. when you do this by yourself, you then believe gravity is real. Do you guys see what's going on? Just literally the, the balls that he just kept has now twisted. So you can measure this. And from this dynamics and measuring the stiffness, you can actually measure gravitational constant. And I think, again, this goes back to the comment. You know, you can watch this video a million times. If any of you actually does it, you will be transformed as a human being. <laughs> you believe in a force that you are bound by. Uh, but, you know, it just, it sort of gives you a little bit of a funny feeling in the stomach when something like this happens. And again, you know, this is also the power of being able to design simple experiments. And, you know, literally this should be an experiment that every, every physics class should do. And, you know, of course, what's really fun is then you can go ahead and calculate and measure and really determine. And I think this was, I would say, the very first time when people started rethinking of how we should design machines, uh, because you could not do this if they had not come up with this notion for these torsional springs, uh, because you want a very calibrated but extremely low stiffness string to be able to measure because this force is quite weak at these sets of, uh, and you also are doing this normal, so normal gravity, which is very, very high, just gets canceled out. There's no, uh, the actual torsional stiffness has nothing to do with normal gravity, unlike many kinds of beams who would still feel gravity. So it's a very clever idea to cancel out, even in a very high gravitational background, you're able to actually measure a force like this. Uh, and I think there are all kinds of really fun things that you can do after that, is now if the displacement is very small, they started putting mirrors and so then you can also use an optical trick, which I think Subhir and a couple people used in their project long time ago. This is called an optical liver. So if you have light bouncing off of it, very small deflection in the mirror could actually show large deflections. So you can also measure something very precise. This is also another aspect of compliant mechanisms that not only can you cause certain sets of very controlled deformations, uh, you can also measure them. Uh, using these types of optical tricks. Uh, and, you know, I think I'm just going to read from this experts. It's quite, it was said that the Coulomb's instrument exceeds all others in delicacy and the power of measuring small forces. And his investigations with it were recommended to students as examples of the most refined, ingenious, and conclusive experiments in natural philosophy. And, you know, I, I love the sets of words like the delicacy, uh, the power of measuring small forces, kind of ingenious. And again, one of the threads about this is uh, you can think about this in many different ways. And one thing that's really fun uh, about this analogy is last week, a paper has just come online that tries to demonstrate that, of course, Leonardo da Vinci beat all of these people at measuring the gravitational constant. It was not known but he was using and dropping water from a vase and he did an experiment that actually measures the gravitational constant to the 10 percent of its accuracy but at that time i mean you have to think about da vinci was 100 200 years before anybody had anything before newton and all of those people there was no calculus there was no mathematics of this form uh, and he actually still did a and what was funny is it was found in one of his notebooks and he didn't write that much about it, but there was a figure that he made for his experiment. And I'll share that on Discord. And that figure, uh, a faculty at Caltech looked at that figure and said, wait a second, what does this figure mean? And he started carefully doing exactly what the figure said. And then they realized that he was actually measuring gravitational constant using a totally new idea. So anyway, it's kind of, uh, it's a historic thread that in the margins of uh, your thoughts might lie uh, some really beautiful discoveries. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the factors here associated now, if you start thinking, if you care about using a wire as a sensitive uh, torsional spring, uh, this scaling becomes very important. 
you can see that the torsional stiffness of a spring goes to the d to the power four. So as you change the diameter, you can get an extreme nonlinearity from it. And it's linear to the length. And so you can change the set of a length as you want. So the finer and finer and finer wires that you can make. And so one of the important things about here is you can see by 9, 1777, Coulomb had developed a theory of the torsion of thin silk and hair strands for use in suspending magnetic needles. He started with hair because at that time, you have to remember this is 1777, we didn't have drawing processes to make perfect thin wires. And here the perfection in the wire matters. So he was literally using long human hair because that was one. And then you can calibrate and measure something and then use it uh, with different sets of analogies. And the reason this trick works is because of this expression. And again, this is why it goes back to when you'll be thinking about compliant mechanisms, you really have to think about, uh, you know, what does it mathematically mean? It's d to the power four that makes this entire trick work. Because if it was not, then you couldn't, by reducing d slightly, you couldn't get very, very large sensitivity. Does that make sense? Um, and then, of course, one of the things is it's quite, it's published. There's lots of work on how to replicate Coulomb's experiments. Uh, you can use this to measure electric charge. And I think, you know, it is, it is a delicate instrument. And I haven't seen a robust version of this instrument. I think it's possible in this day and age for us to build a kind of a prepackaged vacuum instrument that could utilize a framework like this, but is not so delicate because you know I think one of the downsides of this experiment is it's delicate. So you can see the they are getting rid of the air by doing now these enclosed chambers and other things. Uh, so I think you know this is another kind of a thread to sort of think about. Uh, you know the next example that I want to use on compliant mechanism. I'm just going to give you a few sets of examples for you to feel a sense of. Uh, how they make and change uh, many other fields itself. So the other challenge that came in the 1950s what people had realized that diffraction gratings are very important, uh, but diffraction gratings were very difficult to make. So the idea of a diffraction grating is essentially grooves that are at the length scales of uh, the wavelength of light. So hundreds of nanometers, for example. And so they can interact with light in all kinds of strange ways. And I think the most common example that you've all seen probably is this notion of oil slicks. When a thin film of oil goes below the wavelength of light on water, you see all these colors. So you start seeing and separating colors out. But the challenge was uh, that nobody could make them reliably uh, until uh, George Harrison came along, and this is 1950s. And one of the things that he did, he built primarily a machine. I couldn't find a better picture of this machine. Till date, I think this is still the same instrument that's used for making grooves that are ultra repeatable, hundreds of nanometer tolerances, but done in a repeatable mass manufactured manner so that you can actually start making these sets of, so another example of now a mass manufactured uh, kind of a process that uses compliant mechanisms. And again, it's, it's fun to think about how would you make something quite reliable that will make, uh, that will machine something at the scale of hundreds of nanometers, but would still be repeatable enough over long periods of time. Uh, and then the last, but my favorite example of compliant mechanisms uh, and its value to our culture is this object. Uh, this is the original patent for Lego. And you know, I think you might think, why am I saying this in the context of compliant mechanisms? And so uh, I am sure in the hands distance, I might have a piece of Lego. Does anybody have a piece of Lego on your bench where you're sitting? This will tell me how much you love Lego, and I'm looking around, and my Lego box is a little bit far. Nobody has it? <laughs> you guys don't carry Legos in your pocket? Okay, hold on. I'm going to bring my piece. Uh, 
we will have a, a quiet moment uh, of you guys can do a chit chatter until I bring two bricks of Lego. I think it is important, uh, just even if we do it symbolically, to hold two pieces of Lego. Give me one second. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> So long story short, that's how I ended up with a piece of Lego on my. <laughs> oh, that, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has okay. Uh, so anybody has any guess? Why am I calling Lego compliant mechanisms? Because, I mean, they kind of feel stiff to me. They're not moving that much. Uh, and so, of course, the Lego's key patent is this snap that two pieces can join together, right? I mean, that's the key idea. But why am I calling it a compliant mechanism? Anybody? You can just think out loud. Anybody in the class? Anybody online? Because the two can sides like a bands when you attach them to each other. So, okay. So when they attach, where is the bend? In this inside part, like a tube or something like that. Uh, cylinder. Exactly. So, you know, when you see this, there is the, the uh, one piece and then the second piece. But at micron scales, for this to hold, there must be some compliance, right? Because otherwise, if this object was just the right size, which is the negative of this, then there should be no force. There should be no adhesion force. The adhesion force only exists because these things are bending when they are in contact. And similarly, the grooves here are expanding and these sets of nubs are compressing. And that is actually an example of a compliant trick. And this is called a snap joint. We use it all the time now in trying to make objects uh, and ironically, the airplanes that you all take, majority of the joints inside an airplane, uh, I don't know if this will make you not fly, are actually snap joints. So <laughs> there are very little rivets and bolts. There are rivets, of course, in the plane. But because of the resistance that arises at the air, majority of the airplanes, when you're trying to design these types of things, you want to keep them as compliant joints. And many a times they also under load, they get even stronger. Uh, so this was about kind of this, this was a famous patent. You know, this is really 1961. This patent kind of changed the toy industry in many ways. Uh, they had a massive monopoly on this. And again, you know, although this patent has long expired, they still have processes uh, that of how to manufacture something. And so the puzzle comes, you know, okay, so this is well and good. But now let's talk about precision. If you are to take these two objects and combine them together, the question is, what is the accuracy of a two pieces of Lego? When you join them, how accurately do they come together? And kind of one way of thinking about this would be is, you know, error propagates in any mechanical design. So if I snap one brick on another brick on another brick, at some point of time, the errors should accumulate and the, you should not be able to make something like this. I think this is the longest tower that somebody has made with Lego. Uh, but one thing that you should think about is how is it possible that when I stack these Lego bricks and then I want to make a connection with another brick, uh, how come they still snap together? And this was actually a puzzle. And even people at Lego did not know uh, in terms of what is the actual precision, or at least maybe they knew, but they never published it until in the, you know, in the 2000s, there was a PhD thesis at MIT that looked at manufacturing tolerances for Lego. And what they did is something very simple. They took two pieces of Lego and they snapped them together over and over and over again. And what then they do is they take a machine that's called a coordinate measurement machine. A coordinate measurement <laughs> machine 
is essentially an instrument that measures the accuracy. So what it can do is you can tell a position of a given object, it will re record it and you can move it and you can put another object and you can measure the position again in X, Y, Z. And from that you could calculate what is the actual precision. And the result came as a huge surprise for essentially everybody involved in the sets of experiments because one of the things that they were able to do is that they were able to prove that millimeter, you know, these large scale Lego objects have repeatability of mounting that goes all the way in microns. So a couple microns, two or three microns is a good number to kind of think about. So every time you are snapping these two objects together, you can actually get an accuracy associated with this, that this will fall in place to a couples of microns. And that's what's so remarkable about the design. It's not that these two things come together, but they actually come together in an incredibly precise manner. And that just has to do with their processes are very homogeneous. All of these holes have such high precision in how the geometries are made that two objects, and I think this happens to be the cheapest way to do kinematic coupling and very precise mounting. Because if you were to do this otherwise, uh, the other way to do this is called kinematic couplings. And you would have to machine very precise sets of parts. But you can imagine in many types of applications, you want things to be able to fall apart and then come back together in a very precise way. And Lego is the, from a cost-effective scenario, it's the best way to be able to do something like that. And, you know, I think what's fun is uh, somebody got a PhD at MIT uh, playing with Lego, but I'm sure many people have gotten PhDs playing with Lego. Yes, Alankrit. Um, but do we know why this happens? Yeah, I think it's just primarily happens because of the design that's associated with the nubs. This does not work for any random sets of design. Uh, it's a kind of a framework where it's, if you really think about it, it's over constrained. So the system is over constrained and it cancels errors, for example. So rather than doing, you know, for example, what is known in the, the Maxwell kinematic coupling, you're trying to reduce six degrees of freedom of one object. And so you can see there should be six surfaces that mm -hmm. will reduce six degrees of freedom. So this is a much more conventional way of thinking about kinematic couplings. But now you have to think about much more complex geometries that are actually coming together. And then the other part of this is every Lego brick that's made is made with ultra high precision. And this is kind of their magic. This is what nobody else has been able to replicate as well as they do, which is they understand injection molding like no one else. So the material properties, the stiffness, it is just so, and I think the reason I'm emphasizing this so much, I often think about this, imagine the power of that level of precision of injection molded applied to healthcare products applied to, I mean, I have nothing against uh, playful bricks, but there is so much that you could actually do. And they have invested so much in technologies that allow, which are now trade secrets, that essentially make uh, the repeatability of these parts possible. And I think, you know, many a time when we have looked at what we can do in kinds of, uh, it's very difficult to beat the kind of precision that they bring to the table. And, you know, I think now it's going in a different direction where every time a Harry Potter movie comes out, a kid comes out. That's a different story. But the original Lego was really about precision in injection molding. Uh, okay, so then I want to give two more examples and then we'll dive into some of the kind of mechanics and tools. Uh, the other example of manufacturing and compliant mechanisms uh, is uh, I usually, this would be a fun exercise if folks have not done it. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed that in the old days, you had to buy headphones and they would cost a lot of money. Now people just give you headphones. And all of that happened and changed because of how the, the mechanics of how headphones are actually made. And the key component there is this compliant disc and a voice coil is mounted on it. A fantastic 
object and an actuator that can be used in all kinds of projects. But literally, headphones are, you know, pennies nowadays. Uh, and it all comes from the set of processes that combine. And so for some of the folks who were thinking about origami projects, this is a phenomenal way of also building actuation in some of these projects too. And again, uh, it's it's really the precision and the molding of these transparent uh, vibration films and combining them with some of the electronics, which is the magnetic coils themselves. Uh, I think it's it's remarkable to think about the max acceleration in a headphone uh, can go down to 800 meters per second square, so 80 G, uh, which is remarkable to think about because again, you need to do this to be able to match the kinds of frequencies that we want to be able to emit. Uh, the amplitudes are small, but the accelerations are really large. Uh, and again, you know, I think there's a lot to be borrowed from uh, the kind of manufacturing that goes in, in terms of making these types of things. Uh, another extreme example and of compliant mechanisms going back to precision. Now this is not cheap, but what it does is just astronomically uh, impressive. Uh, and so this is the LIGO. This is the business end of, I'm assuming most of you know what LIGO is. Uh, it was the key instrument. It's an, a large interferometer. It's the world's largest interferometer that measured gravity waves. So very, very subtle changes in kind of ripples of space and time. Uh, but why does it work? Because we live on a very noisy planet. There are vibrations all the time. So how can you measure things at you know such precise length scales when we live in such a noisy world, the earth is breathing all the time, it's vibrating all the time, and that's because of vibration isolation. And this is the, this is the older design, uh, but this is the key example. At the bottom, you're actually seeing a mirror that is hanging and suspended on very much like the same torsional springs. So if you remove this frame, this frame is just for protection, but actually the key design is right here. Uh, this is a four pendulum kind of a system where there is the first pendulum, the second pendulum, the third pendulum, and the fourth pendulum. The actual mass is all the way at the back. And this is an incredibly sophisticated vibration isolation system. And this is really mechanically, this is what's going on. And one of the things that you're trying to do with something like this is to use purely compliant mechanisms to do vibration isolations. Uh, and of course, you know, building this with precision is quite expensive. This is a fairly expensive component in LIGO, although it's mostly passive. And then on top of that, they also do some amount of active vibration isolation in which you measure oscillations and you try to cancel them out. But passive is really their key reason why you can actually trust much of these sets of results. And again, you know, it goes a little bit, it's connected to sort of the Cavendish sets of ideas, but then again, uh, it's much more driven by that you want to have many of these sets of things uh, completely isolated uh, using tensioning wires. And then I'm gonna show you guys another vibration isolation mechanism that's related to this, which a student of mine uh, gave me as a gift. Uh, so it's, it's, a uh, hand away. Just give me one second. And then let me actually stop sharing my screen. Uh, this is fun enough that if you guys want to pin my screen so you can see this, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys can see this in full screen. Uh, and I'll just wait a few minutes for you guys to, anybody can explain what are you actually seeing. So you can see here is a platform. I'm holding something in my hand, right? It's a really beautiful object, I have to say. I mean, just, just the beauty of what you're seeing. I'm just going to rotate it around. Notice I can keep something on it so it can hold weight. So if I have these Legos, I can put them right there, right? It can hold weight, but it also feels that it's levitated somehow. Right. And of course, you know, I'm not trying to hide anything. You guys can see the wires, 
there are wires involved. Uh, but I'll let anybody explain. Can anybody explain? It is only, it's, it's stable. Uh, it is vibration isolation. It actually is also thermal isolation. But I'll let you guys decide what is going on. And then, yeah. So anybody who kind of has ideas, you guys can start talking. Well, they're, they're like magnets, right? So there are magnets. That's correct. Right there is the magnet. And the magnet is the key for thermal isolation because the object on the top right there is linked to this piece and that's linked and these are two magnets so you can think about they're trying to attract each other so this is intention so there is a formal word for this does do people know what this is called Kathy has suggested in the chat tenacity yes tensegrity <laughs> so this is an example of tensegrity where you have tension and compression so you can see this thing is under tension and these pieces are under compression. And so uh, I think if most of you at Stanford campus, you should go outside and see there are several tensegrity sculptures out there. But there is something quite beautiful about this. You know, you can now start thinking about in the context of vibration isolation, but also thermal isolation, because you are able to levitate something. And then the reason, um, Laurel, who's one of the students in the lab, gave this to me as a gift, is because I had, uh, for a long time ago, for a class, we had built some Stirling engines. And for my StatMec class, I used to actually do demos for Stirling engines. And Stirling engines are ultra sensitive to heat. And so one of the key things here about this was, oh, can you make, isolate them from any heat baths? And when you isolate them from any heat pots, you can show that it's not a perpetual motion machine, that it almost appears to be because they take any heat gradient. So, and you can see that it's cross section in terms of thermal conductivity is very, very low. Uh, and I think literally it's, it goes back to that same sets of an idea that we had also talked about. Uh, and then I'll just show you guys that if the magnets are not, then the whole thing falls apart. Uh, <laughs> So, but as long as the magnets are there uh, and it's not stable, it's not because these sets of wires are not, they can hold tension, but so it's not so stable in other configurations, but it is stable in these two configurations. Uh, it has some torsional stiffness, uh, but yeah, once it falls apart, then there is no stiffness associated with it other than the magnets. So another example of a compliant mechanism, uh, something that, uh, uh, and again, you know, from a tensegrity point of view, it's also tensegrity is something that is not used as much as it could in many of the design mechanisms themselves. Um, okay, so this is all I wanted to do in terms of case studies. Any questions on the object that people just saw? Uh, because then I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit of some basics of compliant machine design and uh, some of the tools that are associated with it for people that are serious about it. Yeah. Any questions so far? Don't have a question, but I feel compliant mechanism reminds me of uh, the design of the Montreal Olympic Stadium. So there is a segment which is like this, but there are why the, the tension is here. So it's very difficult uh -huh. to understand why it's not, you know, falling over one side. I've oh, never really figured that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, you should, yeah. You should check I it mean, out. <laughs> anybody who lives in Montreal or has visited the Montreal, it was one of the most expensive stadiums made. And I, I was told that uh, Canada almost went bankrupt hosting that Olympics. <laughs> And people were really unhappy. It's like in the Boston, there is the Boston famous uh, highway system. Uh, so it must be that the engineers must have done some magic. But the Montreal Stadium is clearly not a example of frugal design. Right. Because I, it was a very difficult stadium to build. And it has opening roofs and everything. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I think all of you should look around yourself to find examples of these because it's actually quite powerful. You know, one of the things as designers that you all have to learn is remarkable objects have been made by other people and it's often hidden why they actually work. And so just look around yourself, make a list of your favorite mechanisms or your favorite sorts of design principles as a running list because you can borrow all of them in what you're trying to build. Um, okay, so I think we're going to do something fairly simple, first of all. And I think the folks that are interested, I'm happy to run kind of a much more of a, a theory session. Um, but again, the key idea is here are two objects that have the exact same function. The one on the top has many parts, many joints. There is assembly involved, while this is, again, also a vice for crimping mechanism. It's monolithic. It's a single piece, and it performs the exact same function, that it gives you a lever. If you pull between these two points, you should get compression here. You can see there is a joint right there. And it's a little bit harder to see why that would happen in this case. If I am pushing and pulling, and you know none of these shapes really matter so much. They're just providing stiffness. What truly matters are these hinges. So if I was gonna annotate, for example, uh, what really matters is what's happening here, 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 and actually here. And then there is a self-stopping mechanism that beyond a certain point, this will hit and it'll stop. And so I can see four of these sets of joints, one, two, three, four. And very similarly here, you can essentially see those four sets of joints. Uh, but what's key is the fact that these specific joints uh, can have many different shapes. And those sets of shapes would determine how this would behave what the stiffness or the bending stiffness of these joints would look like. So from a CAD point of view, one of the key tools to first think about is often uh, I have some input, I wanna to transition to some output and what is that object I should put in the middle that should give me that transfer function. And there are some mathematical approaches to it, but most creative compliant designs are just done by people's thoughts and ideas. I mean, that's really the functional form of it. I'll tell you some of the more methods and then borrowing from the kinds of compliant mechanisms people have built, but there is a lot of creativity in going from input to output uh, because you have to kind of think about how these sets of things would work. So let's just look through some examples. Uh, this is a common one that we use. I mean, again, let's just start with a few families, for example. So try convincing yourself looking at a shape that if you push with the red arrows, you would get movement in the green direction. So let's start with the first one here. Uh, if I push in this direction, anybody wants to shout out why you would get compression? So if you pull here, why should you get compression on the two sides? First of all, you can identify a symmetry axis. So whatever happens on the left will happen on the right. That's clear, right? Yeah, I think you pull down the, the, the rod. Yeah. Then, then it collapses to the yeah. right at the left. Yeah. So if you pull down this rod, this tries to collapse but that will force these thin beams for these two points to go down, these beams have to bend. And what that would mean is the anchor point on which this stiffer rod is. See, this is thicker and this is thinner. So there's gonna be no movement here. Most of the movement is going to be in this beam and this beam. But if this goes down, it's going to rotate. And by symmetry arguments, this is also going to rotate and hence this is a, is a grip. Right? Okay, easy. Uh, let's move to something more difficult. Uh, so let's try finding, okay, let's do this one. And you know, you can, you can give this as puzzles to yourself. Randomly draw an elastic network and try to convince yourself where would it move. And it's actually quite fun. I am surprised that there doesn't exist. I've been wanting to kind of have like a board game where you pose this as a puzzle. 
and you just poke it around and then only one person is right. Uh, and this would actually be fun. If anybody wants to work with me on that, uh, uh, I think I've been making a lot of these sets of just patterns and this one is actually quite hard. Uh, and the reason it's hard is a little bit because it's not using the conventional units. The, the conventional units to use is to have a few thin beams where majority of the action is and use the stiff parts just to transfer that movement from one place to the other. But if you have a whole bunch of thinner parts, then everything is moving. And then you kind of have to resolve to simulations. So I gave this to you as a trick because this one is not so easy. Uh, while, for example, uh, let's look at this it's fairly similar. You know, you are trying to move this in. There is a rotation that's associated with this. But if you were to think about this, the rotation will be along this axis. Here is the thinnest axis. So the primary bending will occur here. Everything else is quite stiff. And so you would get uh, this thing to move inside. Uh, let's move to a fun one. Um, yeah, this is a very common motif. These are called comb drives. And so one of the things that's used, this is actually, I mean, it's not a secret, so I can mention this. Uh, these mechanisms are actually used in nuclear warheads. Uh, so many of the nuclear warheads have compliant mechanisms as there, and maybe I'll just show you guys a picture of that. Uh, these types of things literally control because they don't want any electronic glitch to suddenly just fire a nuclear arm. So they actually use mechanical mechanisms that are not sensitive to electronic noise. And for this, these are the compliant mechanisms that are used in those. And you can see that this is a linear comb drive where you can get this to be in this state and then it's bistable because the beam likes to either be like that or the reverse curvature. So if I was to draw, the, the two low energy points are here because the distances are such that, so it will snap. So if you just touch it a little bit, boom, it'll snap to the other side. Does that make sense? Because this, this is using a kind of a snap buckling for the spring itself. And then because this is a symmetry axis right there, it will only move in this axis. It cannot move in those other directions because of symmetry. Uh, so, you know, what's really fun about this is these types of mechanisms can both be made to be miniature. So the length scale here is literally, that's 500 microns. So these are ultra, ultra small mechanisms. And this is exactly where uh, many of those uh, macroscopic mechanisms actually fail. Um, so let's go to this part, for example. I mean, I think thinking about this, this is a much more classical design where they're using components that make a lot of sense. The key component here is essentially a notch and a stiff object. So it's a combination of stiff and compliant uh, notch hinge, this is called. Uh, and effectively, now you can see, I don't know if some of you can see a four bar linkage here. If I have four of these together, you can see this will move as a four bar linkage. So there is a hidden four bar linkage right there. But now there are certain sets of places that are fixed itself as well. And, you know, this is a classic motif that's embedded inside this larger design structure. And, you know, this is very much uh, what I would think of as a serial design in compliant mechanisms, where you start with one place, you start building, and then you keep adding function, and you can understand it as you cross over. Uh, rather than thinking about designing something where everything is interacting with each other. Uh, uh, you can do the same thing also for rotational. So you don't have to just think about this in XY. You can think of this as in torsion. So this, for example, is a compliant mechanism that's going to go in Z axis. So the degree of freedom that is available here is like that. 
Uh, and you can see that these sets of plates are not moving in plane. They're actually moving out of plane because you've created this out of shim stock. Uh, and so you would get a compliance that's in this direction. And then I think similarly in this context, if you go above, now this is for torsion. This is associated with twist. So you don't have to just design an XY. You can actually also just design in a twist kind of a context. Uh, and then, of course, this goes totally crazy when you really start thinking about uh, complete 3D. Uh, so this is a kind of an iris, for example, for an optical component where you have the iris closing. And Disney for a while has a big group that's been doing compliant mechanisms. And I'll just play this video. Uh, I like this because, I mean, of course, this is done in the context of animatronics. There's only one degree of freedom. There. There's just one motor. But you can see in one single 3D printed part, they actually have the entire leg of a moving robot, for example. So if this was connected in multiple sets of ways, you could actually get this thing to move. Uh, and you can follow this set of a trajectory so there is a trajectory that they are trying to follow here, which is an arbitrary curve, while the input is just rotation. And what's really fun about this, this is printed out of one single piece. This is just one single 3D printed part. Um, and again, uh, a kind of a, a few sets of clever designs that you can see here, which they're not so obvious, but notice what's going on there. <laughs> They have these tri joints where this connects to that, this connects to that, and this connects to that. They're not connected in the middle. There is a degree of freedom. You can actually see that same joint play out here where there is a beam from A to B, B to C, and C to A. So it's a little bit hard to see, but take a look at this. A to B, B to C, and C to A. And it's a very clever entanglement. And then you can think about, you will get certain kind of twist on this, uh, but it's not done with a prismatic. Like often enough, you would create this twist by mounting a hole with a pin with three objects moving, but then you won't have relationship between all three of them. Only two of them can have that relationship. But here you have three objects connected together. And this is a very unconventional design. Uh, of and actually even why it works. So I don't know if it's obvious to people. If this is A, A is connected to B by one beam, B is connected to C by one beam, and C is connected to A by the third beam. And so if you take an object like this and you twist it or you move it, what is the relationship between A, B, and C? And I would put this in the category of this is very creative, it just comes out of somebody's head to say, hey, what happens if we do this? This, uh, And then, of course, people simulate it to find, and then it becomes a motif. So the key motif that you guys should remember, first of all, uh, and then maybe I'll just share something that I built a long time ago that I'm super proud of. This was a six-axis stage, uh, now all done in a single monolithic structure. And what I was trying to do is make these types of hexapods, but with not that many parts. Uh, and the reason I had built this for was I called this project a pocket milling machine. Can you make a milling machine that's six degree of freedom that you can carry in your pocket? This was that big, so it didn't really fit in my pockets. I would need a very big pocket. But I think I've been re revisiting this idea. I did this in grad school and the desire that, you know, 15 years have passed and we still don't have pocket milling machines. So if anybody is excited, I want to revive this back again, just for fun. Like imagine walking to somebody, opening up just like a little watch and showing them a manufacturing of an ultra small piece. Uh, but then it's also, uh, you know, there's a lot of beautiful things uh, that can now be done in small scale. So again, here, what is very clever is there are six degrees of freedom. I have all the rotational degrees of freedom. If I move these three actuators together, then I get pure rotation. So this is, if this and this and this moves, 
by symmetry arguments, you can convince yourself that this will purely rotate, right? But here's the clever trick. Now, if I do this in combinations, I can actually do pure translation or pure x-axis translation and pure y-axis translation. And it almost feels like cheating, but because I know the map that exists, it's not a linear map. When I move this, it moves both x, y, and twist. If I only move one actuator, it also does the same. But I have a map between moving purely in x and what should be the, and because you can compute it and computation is cheap. So this is another way of entangling your axis in a way because you can compute the map. You don't need to be that one actuator should only control one degree of freedom in a one-to-one -one manner, which is a classic principle we use in all machines. You know, you say this is the x-axis actuator. In this case, there is no one x-axis actuator. You have to move all of them together. Uh, but then one of the fun things about this is it seems like I got the rotational degree of freedom out of a mechanism like this. And then again, you know, there are certain thermal aspects and other things itself. Uh, and for each one of these, the only component that initially I want you all to worry about, if some of you, first of all, uh, you know, it won't be at the taste for everyone, uh, but there is a much more formal, I'm running out of time. So maybe I'll just jump to the formal method of design. Yeah. So one thing I'll mention is if some of you who are interested in this in a more formal way and want to actually learn, uh, there is a methodology that's now been developed in the last, I would say, only four or five years. So when I was in grad school, it was all seat of the pants design. We would sit and think, and then we would make it, and then we would do simulation, and then we would sit and think, and it didn't do. And I think now the field has matured enough. It's called FACT. Uh, it's a flexure design methodology. There's beautiful sets of videos on FACT online already. So... I'll just copy this here for folks to actually see. Uh, there is an entire online course dedicated to fact designs. Uh, and just, you know, I think, again, it really is for people that are excited, but just a beautiful sets of lectures on uh, how to follow those sets of principles. Uh, and I think the key idea is that for every degree of freedom that you are trying to implement, somebody has already found a transfer function for it. And what you're trying to do is build this in a manner while making sure that you don't over constrain your system. Because if you constrain it in a manner that you just started adding sets of components, and if you constrain it, then everything essentially jams. So that's the trick, is, is the fact that you want to start, so if you want a four degree of freedom kind of a mechanism, here is the universe of all of them that people have found. If you want three degree of mechanism, here is the universality class of all of them that have been found. And it sort of gives you this uh, format of a table uh, to build from. And I think one of the things that it happens then is, uh, and there's a lot that's been written on this. Uh, and I think, yeah, uh, Jonathan Hopkins was one of the graduate students at MIT that uh, did much of this as a methodology where you can see that you can start with a given geometry, you specify the desired degree of freedoms that you care about, you select the kinds of constraints, and then you really start breaking them down into the degree of freedoms that you care about, then you check for the non-redundant, and then you finally confirm whether the sets of symmetries give you the function that you care about. So uh, I think one of the fun things about this would be is if somebody wants, uh, I'm happy to run a little tutorial on this. Folks can first watch some of the videos. It's always useful to do it in the context of a project. And so I know several of you have, I think maybe Subhir, you definitely have one compliant like project with the laptop. But it's, it is really worthwhile to picking up some of this. And again, you know, not all of you are as obsessed by compliant design. So not all of you have to go through this. But for people that are interested, it really is a wonderful tool to have under your belt. Uh, okay, I want to close with just one last bit, you know, returning to origami for a second. 
which is compliant mechanisms can also be made in origami and kirigami. So this is, it's quite non-intuitive to think about, but one of the threads is that, you know, if you just take a sheet of paper uh, and you are to just stretch it, it actually turns out it bends in very strange sets of ways. So these are higher order mechanisms because the entire sheet is compliant because it's bending in this axis to be very, very uh, soft. Uh, and one of the things that's valuable about this is another example of that is what are called non-Euclidean springs. This is a toy that many of you have seen. We get it for our parties. You just take a helix or a spiral, cut a spiral in a piece of paper, and then just hang it. And you see it goes in into a spring. Uh, and writing down what is the spring stiffness of that spiral is actually quite a complex problem. Uh, and so this was a, a beautiful set of, you know, these sets of ideas around non-Euclidean springs, that these things don't have to also be made out of flat sheets. Up till now, we were talking about compliant mechanisms that fit a flat sheet. But imagine making a ball or a sphere, like a hollow sphere, and cut it. So now the sheet is not, it's not straight. And so it's non-Euclidean. It doesn't fit directly a flat sheet, but you can still make compliant mechanisms out of it. And this is a very recent idea that people have been able to make compliant mechanisms that are conformal. And now going back to the hand idea is you can imagine a compliant mechanism that is not in any plane, in any fixed plane. It's actually, or not in X, Y, Z planes, but it's on lives on a curve. Uh, and this is another kind of a hairy aspect because, you know, we don't have the design tools for it. You know, you, you really have to just play with it. So if you are to take an elastic ball and try cutting it in ways, it won't behave the same mechanism if it was flat sheet because curvature shows up in places that you didn't think of. So this is another kind of a really fun space and compliant mechanisms currently. Uh, and actually, okay, maybe last image that I want to show you guys and leave with is nature has always been there way before us. Uh, so all wings in all insects are compliant mechanisms. So, you know, I don't know if you guys like houseflies or not. I really like houseflies. It probably in many places where you're sitting, it's flying around. You know, don't just squat it, take a look at it. All the wings are compliant mechanisms, but what's really cool are these halt tears. Uh, so these halt tears are what gives insects their capacity to do gyroscopic calculations. It's a compliant mechanism of just a beam attached to a mass. And these halt tears are actually present. This is a crane fly. And you can see it's just a mass. It's a pendulum attached to a thin piece. And when it flies, it vibrates. And from this, it's able to calculate its pitch, yaw, and roll all dynamically, primarily by just seeing how this thing is vibrating. So really beautiful. Long before people came up with gyroscopes for stabilizing airplanes, insects were flying with gyroscopes, primarily using a compliant mechanism. And then my favorite compliant mechanism in the animal world actually comes from spiders. So it actually turns out that spiders don't use muscles, they use compliant mechanisms, which is hydraulics. So when a spider dies, I'm sure all of you have seen a dead spider crumples in, its legs go inside. That's its rest state. And because uh, spiders use hydraulics, because a spider is dead, it cannot generate the internal pressure. The legs essentially curl back. So, you know, it, it kind of looks this depressing image of a spider curled back. Uh, that's just because it's lost its internal pressure. And to move, it generates that pressure that makes that compliant mechanism go straight. But then when the pressure gets released, it curls back right in. And there is this, uh, the compliant mechanism actually comes in how these edges fold. So there is also folding right here because this won't move because exoskeletons don't have holes. So all of this is happening on a tube. So anyway, this is another really fun. If some of you are not scared of spiders, you know, try catching one, take a look at it carefully because it would be, it's, you know, many of these design ideas are literally hidden everywhere.
So it's 10 o'clock, we're, we're out of time, uh, but I think this was the last formal lecture that I wanted to give in terms of uh, uh, tools that you have. Uh, I'll stay online for any sets of project conversations and folks people have. I know there's one team in the class that I need to meet. So if you guys could just stay over and come close to Abina's computer, we can chat uh, on the project side. Uh, and then anybody else who wants to hang out, maybe I'll, I'll spend 10, 15 minutes with one team and then switch to another team uh, just so we can cover some of the... Uh, some of the Fred Parks or any discussions uh, people need to have for their projects. So I'll say bye to kind of the, 